We always knew the site was there, but we thought it was gone due to erosion. My grandfather would tell about the uh, bow and arrow wars, about two kids, you know, playing with darts, and one eye was poked, so the other kid's father came and did the same thing. So from that, it became a full-blown war. To see this excavation bring that story alive is one of the most fascinating things I've seen. I mean, the stories we've heard and the evidence they're pulling out from Lunasa, it's no longer a legend, it's becoming a fact. My name is Rick Connect, and I'm principal investigator of the project. We have 11 PhDs. We use a lot of student volunteers. We work with professional conservators to make it all happen. We've got uh, Dr. Paul Ledger, who's working on the history of climate here. Dr. Veronique Forbes, who's an archaeoentomologist who studies insects. Uh, Dr. Kiki Ashlock, who's also a professional archaeologist from southeast uh, Alaska. Uh, Dr. Madonna Moss is from the University of Oregon, who specializes in faunal analysis. There are mussel shells throughout the site. There's another bigger piece, and we, and we don't know where they're coming from. The Nunalik site uh, was originally um, a village. Uh, elders tell us that this site extended out about 200 feet. Since 2009, we've lost more than 30 feet on that piece of shoreline. And uh, our 2009 and 2010 excavation blocks are completely gone already. It's very much a race against time. But this particular structure with a covered boardwalk running down the middle of it was an adaptation to the bow and arrow wars. That was a period of intense conflict between different native villages here in the YK Delta and uh, no one knew exactly when it had happened other than it happened before the Russians arrived. This collective communal house was burned down by attackers from another village up to Kuskokwim. We think it happened about 1640 based on carbon dates of the charred grass and so on on the floor. We've been excavating Nunasak for about six years now. I uh, sent Rick a few pictures of artifacts I had from the locals. He came right over. He didn't even unpack. He went down the beach and they started walking and they started finding artifacts. Those first group was a tough bunch. There's these three students and a professor that come down and start looking for artifacts. Wind, rain, shine, they do it. My mind was saying, man, these guys are crazy. But they're trying to beat the erosions. We get bugs, we get weather, we get wind, we get rain. Ouch, there's one now. Um, and so they're pretty challenging conditions. We put in as many hours as we physically can, 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week, just so we can get to it in time. Pizza! Give me pizza! <laughs> Rick's just great, he's, he doesn't stop. He, he's a perfect person for this site. I wouldn't have no one else run this site except him. Well, I first came to Alaska to work as a graduate student in 1983, and luckily it was a preserved uh, site much like this one in Kodiak. And that one was also eroding, and we worked hard to get a sample from that, but at the same time, our assumption was there, there were going to be more sites like that. And the whole thing washed out. There wasn't even a rock, a firecrack rock left behind. That was shocking. And we ended up only getting a 10% sample at best. And that's not going to happen again. We're getting things that normally you just see in museum collections. We're, we've got arrows with the feathers still lashed to them, grass rope that was used to make uh, dog harnesses, that kind of preservation. 
There's a piece of hair right here. I found that in my screen. PT found a ridiculously large amount of hair and Bridget found another huge clump of hair today. It seems like when they cut their hair, they just let it fall wherever it wanted to, so. There's the lamp. <laughs> the hair is kind of sticking out right there. It's all over the place, actually. There's been way hairier lamps, too. It's like, oh, you find hair and you're like, oh, this is like a hair sample, and then you dig a little more and then it's actually a lamp. <laughs> Bridget found an earring in the screen. Yeah, that's definitely fun. Yeah. And then I would have a, it goes up to about there, I think. So I don't know how they actually wore them, like how it fit it kinda, in. Yeah, they kind of look like clip-ons. So like. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that we're up to around 30,000 museum quality pieces which will be coming back to Queen Hawk in 2017. We're hoping to get a cultural center built here, um, and then I'm hoping all the artifacts will remain in the village. We estimate the site might have five to 10 years left maximum. It could be lost in one big winter storm. It's like a museum's on fire or a library, and you have to rush in and save as many books and pieces of art as you can. And we're seeing things that um, people remember from their childhoods. Elders uh, have a chance to reacquaint themselves and their children with tangible remains of their heritage. Yeah, this project's been great. I'm just honored to be part of it, a small part of it.